Hello everyone, I'm Rolly Jindu Malaog and my report is all about oral lore from pre-colonial times. So when we say oral lore, this pertains to an oral tradition or a form of human communication wherein literature is passed and preserved from one generation to another orally. So this simply means that in these times, literary forms were not written, but spoken, chanted, or sung. So as long as those are orally performed, then those are under oral lore. And the particular period that we're going to delve in is the pre-colonial times, which started from BC, according to Ms. Given Lapid's previous report, up to 1564, or the last year before our country was fully conquered. Because in 1565, Philippines was already officially and earnestly colonized by the Spaniards. In order for us to learn more about it, let's have some history time. So this history that I'll be discussing is based from notes on Philippine literature, a history, and anthropology by Bienvenido Lembrera. Okay, so a long time ago, Filipinos used to live their serene lives on their own. They weren't yet under the control of anybody until the colonizers arrived here in our country. And we already know who they are, the Spaniards. Okay, so in 1521, Ferdinand Magellan's fleet arrived here and their country was called the Islas Filipinas many years after. Now, does it mean that uh, the year of the Spaniards' arrival was also the start of the official colonization? Well, no. As I said a while ago, it was in 1565 and not in 1521. Here's why. 1521 was only the year of the Spaniards' arrival, but our country wasn't yet officially colonized by that year. Yes, they were able to influence Filipinos with Christianity, but our country wasn't yet fully conquered by that time because Magellan died in the Mactan battle, remember? So after his death, only the ship of Victoria was able to go back to Spain. And on his return, the king decided that they should already conquer the Philippines. So he sent five subsequent expeditions to our islands. So he sent an expedition in 1525, 1526, 1527, 1542, and 1564. But unfortunately, all of those failed. Then, many years later, another expedition was sent, and that was led by Miguel Lopez de Gaspi. So that year, which was particularly in 1565, he was able to establish an official Spanish settlement here. So that's why pre-colonial period ended in 1564 because our country was officially and earnestly conquered in 1565. Okay, going back, so Filipinization of Spanish Catholicism, so they introduced their religion here and many of our early Filipinos were influenced by it. Next, civilization and establishment of settlements. So when the Spaniards arrived here in our country, they thought that Filipinos were not civilized. So let's try to find out some of the reasons why. Okay, so let's try to look back at how our natives, ethnic minorities, and tribal Filipinos used to live. So they were wearing black and woven cloth, etc. So men were merely wearing bahags and women, actually most of them were topless during these times. And that's one of the factors that made the Spaniards think that they were not civilized because uh, according to their uh, Spanish standards or perspectives, they really think that it's very inappropriate for women women to dress like that. And uh, it had been also part of the tradition to chew betel nuts, and they had been doing it for 3,000 years. And if you aren't aware of what betel nuts are, um, many of our Filipino tribes are still eating it or chewing it. And uh, those are particularly the Ifugo tribes. And if you're watching any documentaries about them, you're going to find out that it's still part of their culture and they call it mama or nganga. Filipinos lived in villages along sea coasts, river banks, bigger sources of food, and most convenient transportation routes. So they are called nomads. 
uh, this is because they do not have any permanent home and they just randomly go to those places where they think they can survive. So sometimes they are in seacoast, sometimes they are in riverbanks, everywhere actually, as long as there are good food resources and easy transportation routes. As they go from place to place, they had this one tradition wherein they would gather around and they would tell native oral and literary forms to one another. So in total, they had six various literary forms and those are epics, proverbs, riddles, loas, legends, and myths. So later on, we're going to talk about them one by one. Filipinos had a culture that linked them with the Malays of Southeast Asia, a culture with traces of Indian, Arabic, and possibly Chinese influences. So that's because the or the ancestors of the vast majority of our early Filipinos were Malays, and they came from the Southeast Asian mainlands. So yeah, that's why. Next, there are epics, songs, short poems, tales, and Dances and rituals gave them a native Asian perspective, which served as a filtering device for the Western culture that the colonizers brought over over from Europe. So yeah, that's what uh, makes their culture different from the ones that are in the Western side of the world. Let's say that this guy on the left side is the one selling a particular literary form. And the general subject matter of what he is telling is usually about people's common experiences, which includes food gathering, creatures and objects of nature, work in the home, field, forest, and sea. Uh, these subject matters are usually influenced by their religious beliefs and culture. By the way, uh, their culture is called pagan culture, and in that culture, they worship those uh, lifeless objects that they see in the environment because they consider them as their gods. And they thought that uh, there were multiple gods because they worshipped a lot of objects like trees, rocks, etc. And these are the conventions of various oral literary forms, so from like repetitions, stereotyping of characters, regular rhythm and musical devices. So all of them are familiar with this because for them, any member of the community is a potential poet or storyteller. So as long as he knew the language and this four conventions of literary forms, then he's qualified. And they did not emphasize authorship. Oral lore belongs to the community. So the work of one is the work of everyone. One's masterpiece is everyone's masterpiece. And also they use language of daily life. And uh, the first period of Philippine literature, particularly the pre-colonial period, is the longest. And just by knowing the fact that it started from BC up to 1564, we already know the reason why, because that's really uh, a long period of time. On the arrival of the Spaniards, um, they also noticed that there's something about our native syllabary that must be modified. So this is how our native syllabary used to look like. So we only had three vowels, so A, I, and E are in one, as well as U and O, and there were only 14 consonants. So syllabary fell into disuse among Christianized Filipinos. So when the Spaniards found this out, um, they thought that this kind of incomplete syllabary could not um, produce creative works since the letters are limited and it may be undecipherable to those who haven't had any contact or familiarity with um, the text. So they introduced the Roman or Latin alphabet to Filipinos. So again, yeah, valuable information for loss and fewer and fewer Filipinos kept their oral lore and that's why only few were able to decipher it and as time passed by most of them were already forgotten. Filipinos were animistic. They worshipped objects 
and we're quite aware that it's different from what Christianity says. So their perishable materials were destroyed by missionaries against pagan culture. And these materials apparently pertain to their anitos. And the Spaniards burned them apparently because they considered them as the handicrafts of the devil. And this has something to do with the term iconoclasm. So yeah, that's what they did. They burned them all. But some Filipinos were still able to preserve their culture and they were able to do that in two ways. So the uniqueness of indigenous culture survived colonization and here are the two ways that they did. First, they had resistance to, this, resistance to colonial rule. Next, they also had the vision of isolation from centers of colonial power. So first, some of them were able to keep the integrity of their uh, ethnic heritage by being resistant to the colonial rule, meaning they still stick to it no matter what the Spaniards said or pushed them to do. And second, they were able to cling on their traditional way of living because they are far from the center of colonization and they did not come under the cultural sway of the western colonizers. This is William Henry Scott. He's a historian who wrote about the discrepancy between what is actually known about the pre-Hispanic Philippines and what has been written about it. So, in the course readings in Philippine history, we learn that there are some preferences or biases when it comes to written accounts. Now, for example, if we're gonna look at the accounts of Antonio Picapeta, you know, some say that it's somehow biased to the side of the Spaniards because, of course, he's a Spaniard. You know, and his preferences are seen by how he described Filipinos. Unfortunately, early Filipinos only had their writings on materials that eventually wither like leaves, barks of the tree. Yeah, their writings eventually disappeared as time passed by. And those writings of the Spaniards were kept, so those are usually the ones that are being used as references. So there were two Spaniards who were able to create a collection of a collection that provides some samples of oral lore from pre-colonial times. And those were Juan de Naceda and Pedro de San Lucar. So in English translation, um, vocabulario de la lengua Tagala means vocabulary of the Tagalog language. So let's try to take a look of what they collected. So here are some samples of early oral lore from their collection. They have monorhyming heptasyllabic lines from the word mono, single rhymes, and hepta, seven syllables per line. And they also have ambahan or a contemporary hanuno chanted by mangyans. So it's about human relationships and social entertainment. And they also have tanaga, stanza formed with four lines, Hispanized descendant of ambahan. So after knowing that tanaga is a Hispanized version, you'll be like, what? Why is it Hispanized when we're only talking about pre-colonial period and not yet the Spanish colonial period? Well, the history that I just talked about a while ago answers that question. Because um, Spaniards were already here even before the official colonization happened. So yeah, and those who first arrived here had apparently Hispanized Tanaga before Miguel Lopez because we had fully conquered our country. So, yeah. They have also collected some lyric poetry, so fable, genealogies, and vainglorious deeds of their gods. Religious lives of people are based on the tradition. And they also have some prose narratives, origin myths, hero tales, fables, and legends to explain natural phenomena, past events, and contemporary beliefs in order to make the environment less fearsome by making it more comprehensible and to make idle hours less dead use and to entertain and to explain. So, there's a difference between this two, lyric poetry and prose narratives. Lyric poetry, um, this consists of short poems that were originally accompanied by music. While prose narratives, uh, these are stories that do not contain any formal metrical structure. So, the stories are just in continuous narrative form. And later, we're gonna find out how they make their environment less fearsome 
no? when we already discuss about myths. Drama as a literary form has not yet begun in pre-colonial times, but they had their own kind of performances. And those are nomadic dances, imitating natural cycles, and work activities. Now that we're done with the discussion of how their lives used to look like during pre-colonial times, let's now move on to the discussion of what I was talking about earlier, the six literary forms from pre-colonial times. Okay, so let's first talk about epics, literary and classical and most significant pieces of literature. So when we hear the word epic, we already know that it's a poem and it has something to do with heroic deeds. And here in our country, we had various ethno epics that were orally passed by early Filipinos from different cultures. And those were surveyed by Arsenio Manuel. So he surveyed at the epics and he also described them. And 13 of those epics were influenced by the pagan culture or the, the native and fire culture of the Filipinos. And two of those were influenced by the Christian culture or the one that's brought by the Spaniards. And four of those were influenced by Muslims or uh, the culture of people from Mindanao. Now let's talk about the common features of those epics. Narratives of sustained length. Uh, so narrative, this means that uh, these are stories. But what makes the stories different is that uh, they have verses. And these are not in the form of prose where in the flow is just continuous. And these narratives have sustained length too because uh, epics are really considered as long narrative films. Next, space and oral tradition. Yes, especially in pre-colonial times where everything is just really orally passed. Next, revolving around supernatural events and heroic deeds. Yes, that's what basically epics are all about. And with seriousness of purpose embodying or validating the beliefs, custom, ideals, or life values of the people in the form of verse, yes, since these are poems, and chanted their songs, since we're talking about the epics in pre-colonial times. By the way, uh, last semester, we also discussed some of uh, the famous Greek epics, and those are the Iliad, the Odyssey, Enid, Ganon. Uh, but now, let's try to look at some of the epics of our own that were orally passed from pre-colonial times. So, here they are. Okay, so, here we have four examples. So, we have Biag Nilam Ang, Tuwa Ang, Kinilawod, and Bantugan. So, Biag Nilamang is from Christian Alokos, in Eskanoyan, eaten by monster fish Rarang, brought back to life by his rooster, and so on. So, since it's from Christian Alokos, that means that this epic is already influenced by the Christian culture. Next to Waang is a pagan epic, Manuvas of Central Mindanao, the Maiden of Buhong Sky. And Hinilawad is also a pagan epic, Sula of Panay, longest epic, yep, because it has two parts which are Labaw Dengan and Humadapnan. Okay, so these two of your pagan epics survived and became resistant to decolonization. The Diba we discussed a while ago that there were some Filipinos who were still able to keep their oral lore. So um, the creators of these epics, these pagan epics, were probably far from the center of colonization or they just really remained resistant and because of that these epics were able to survive and still be collected and yeah, next we have Mantugan which is a Maranao epic so not much information was gathered about it but yeah it's a Maranao epic and that means it's a Muslim epic since Maranaos live in Mindanao For our next literary form, we have Proverbs in Tagalog, Salawikain. The literary relevance of these short sayings is clear. So, unlike epics, these are just very short, but the message can be conveyed if we would try to deeply contemplate about it. Next, Proverbs are each source of imagery and succinct expression. So, through imagery, we can imagine what we hear, since uh, proverbs from pre-colonial times are 
only orally told or orally passed no and i guess we're already aware of the different types of imagery which are visual imagery for sight olfactory imagery for smell um, auditory imagery for hearing gustatory imagery for taste and tactile imagery for touch and when we say succinct um, proverbs are just very brief but those are very clear and the speaker who is some sort of an artist in the use of words the proverbs is a model of compressed or forceful language so in spite of how short or compressed a proverb is the chosen words are still so powerful to the point that you you'll have certain realizations in life after hearing it no and a proverb is a body of short statement built upon over the years and which will like the thought and insight of people into problems of life yes the messages are always worth knowing because they give life lessons and in addition to drawing on it for its words of wisdom the speaker takes interest in its verbal techniques its selections of, selection of words its use of comparison its method of statement and so on so through this techniques the messages are being expressed verbally in a very artistic way it is a feeling for short for language for imagery and for the expression of abstract ideas through compressed and elusive phraseology comes out particularly clearly in proverbs the figurative quality of proverbs is especially striking one of their most noticeable characteristics is their elusive wordings usually in metaphorical form so let me highlight this one so elusive wordings it has something to do with illusion no illusion it's a figure of speech and it is used when we try to mention or allude to a person place thing events going on and those people in pre-colonial times when they use allusions in their literary works they apparently refer to or allude to the names of their gods sacred places or things okay, now let's talk about riddles in tagalog bugtong these are short question answer statements and like proverbs they are expressed briefly and concisely they involve analogy whether of meaning sound rhythm or tone and the two forms are sometimes even combined in the proverb riddle so it um, proverb riddles involve analogy or um, a comparison of two otherwise unlike things that are based on resemblance of a particular aspect and riddles also sometimes have close connections with other aspects of there are expressions with such forms as enigmas and dilemma deals with stories and epigrams so um, when we say enigma it is something or someone puzzling uh, mysterious or inexplicable and when we say dilemma it's a circumstance in which a choice must be made between two or more alternatives that um, seem equally undesirable and in spite of such connections, however, uh, riddles emerge as a distinct type of literary expression, often one considered to be the special domain of children and, unlike proverbs, to be for entertainment rather than for serious consideration. Yep, because uh, riddles also serve as entertainment to kids. And it's fun because the uh, tricky questions make them think that, or make them think of, possible answers and these are also not as serious as proverbs because um, proverbs are already like advices to um, late adolescents or adults now let's have loas so loa is a folk tradition that mirrors the Ilongas folks creative or poetic intuition so intuition it's something that our early Filipinos somehow thought or understood without proof or evidence it encapsulates in a single form in the workings of the creative mind of the Ilonga folks or the common Tao with ordinary souls that one may meet in his daily existence uh, those are housewives farmers standbys 
uh, laborers, teachers, and even students. So they are the common taos because uh, they are usually the ones that are commonly seen in the community. And as ordinary as they are, uh, their loa is a proof of an extraordinary mind whose creativity flows spontaneously from the soul. So just like what I was talking about a while ago. So when uh, they believe that all of them had potentials and those are proven by their creative loas in spite of how ordinary those common taos are. And sensitivity to the Ilonga folks' external senses to the sounds and size of their immediate surrounding resulted to the loas orchestral and musical versification. So here we can say that loas are usually chanted because um, they are accompanied by uh, orchestral and musical sounds. Alright, so if you want to learn more about loas, here are more definitions. So, the words and sounds do not only please the ears, but they also challenge the thought process. So, these sounds are not just good to listen to, they also hone our mind's thinking capacity. And Loa speaks, relating that which have been perceived by the mind through the senses, hence ideas clothed in denotations and connotations may be unearthed. So, denotation, it's the direct and explicit definition of words, while connotation, uh, it's not the literal meaning. These are just um, emotional suggestions of words. For example, the word dove, um, as its denotation, it simply means uh, it's a bird and it flies. On the other hand, as its connotation, it means um, peace, hope, tranquility, kanan. And it also reveals that Ilonga's closeness to nature and to the things around them. So this is clearly evident in the survey images or sense experiences used in Loa. So um, their Loas are usually about nature and surrounding. So perception and translation into image evoking words undergoes a process. The folk mind through the external senses perceives things or the reality around him and through his imagination and intellect transmits the image to the soul and the image the image as interpreted by the soul is transmitted back through the intellect and imagination into a concrete meaningful form so uh folk poverty or the uh, so it's like imagery because there's this imagination process that uh that's going on as you hear it Okay, so here are more definitions of loas. With this meaningful form, loa signifies something. It is a sign, complete with tangible form. So simply, those common taos as the creators of loas use symbolisms in their works. And the meaning found in loa may be clothed in metaphorical form. So they are being um, direct when it comes to comparisons. It may also be disguised in symbolic representations. Hence, loa may be interpreted in its textual context alone. Nevertheless, as a sign, Lua with its textual evidence may be interpreted in its social cultural context. So the context of their Lua is social cultural. Therefore it's about the social setting in which the um, in which this common taos live or interact with one another. And Loha Loa then is an artistic or creative expression of the Ilongo folks, such expression of which finds realization in a particular cultural practice by a group of people, which are the Ilongos. So it's like a masterpiece that's exclusively from Ilongos. So here we have four examples of Loas. And we can notice that some of these are already Hispanized because some have the words tinidor, kutsara, la mesa, which are Spanish words. And these were apparently Hispanized by the time that um, the Spaniards arrived here up to 1564, which was the last year of um, the pre-colonial period. And some of the words or nouns that you see here are concrete or tangible. So each of them represents particular symbolism. So before we talk about the features of myths and legends, let's first try to differentiate them from one another. 
So here we have five questions and those will be answered. So for our first, first question, is there any evidence that events occurred or people existed? Legends? Yes, but evidence may be insubstantial. So that means it's still lacking of strength and solidity, not to be credible enough. Myths? None. Next, when and where did it happen? Legends? Typically in more recent historical past, usually from a specific culture. Myths? No evidence to prove it as a fact. Next, is it a fact or fiction? Legend? Facts are distorted or exaggerated. Which makes it somehow absurd because of the, the exaggeration. No. Myths, no evidence to prove the fact about fictional stories explaining how the world was created and some type of natural situation that occurred. Next, who are they about? Legend, notable people from history. And there are also some legends there about notable um, places, animals, things, no. and myths gods and supernatural realm next what are they about legend often about heroic deeds overcoming obstacles but may also be about evil doing so just like epic it also has something to do with heroic deeds but don't confuse yourselves between the two no epic is a narrative poem while legend it's a it's a narrative prose and myths Traditional narrative that explains natural phenomena through symbolism and metaphor. So it often involves the gods of Asian cultures. So later on, we're going to find out or we're going to learn more about it when we already discuss about the features of myths. Okay, so let's have the characters and settings of legends first. Characters in a legend are limited to a small cast. They may be inanimate objects or humans with super traits. They may appear in a human form but maintain immortality and supernatural abilities. Legends typically take place in the past and the setting is somehow relevant to the culture from which it is derived. Legends are usually based on real characters and events even though this have been richly embellished and exaggerated over time. Yes, uh, it's really the exaggeration that makes legends somehow hard to believe, though uh, they say that there are certain evidences that those are real. And this gives the narrative an exciting quality because all the events seem to be within the realm of possibility even when the plot has become so widely adapted or updated that it is completely fictional. Yes, legends are always interesting to hear, but uh, as time passed by, Legends have become more fictional, which makes it a lot farther from reality, primarily because of the changes brought by adaptations over time. Okay, now let's have the Legends plot. A Legends plot will include a lot of action, suspense, and conflict. The characters of a legend are often faced with difficult obstacles to overcome and struggle with their fate or destiny. So difficult obstacles and struggles, these are the ones that give a uh, thrill to legends. The plot of a legend usually focuses on individual character, a cultural hero, or a person respected and remembered. But there are also uh, legends about places, objects, and legendary animals. So aside from um, person, legends, there are also some legends about places objects and animals so this is what i was talking about earlier next they also convey meaning about the way we live our lives that make them relevant and interesting across cultures and time this makes them worth repeating through generations correct legends like myths reveal information about the way people live what they lived, what was important to them and what they valued and what they were afraid of so it allows us to look back and learn more about the lives of those people. Okay. Here are some examples of legend themes. We have good and evil, friend and foe, magic, the supernatural, rich and poor, rags to riches, riches to rags, wise and foolish, strong and weak, just and unjust, a quest or search, a journey, trials, and forfeit. Now let's have the point of view. 
legends are written from the third person point of view. So if I were the speaker, it's not my perspective. It's also not yours, but it's the point of view of someone else or other people that are being talked about. Next, a legend will reflect about a society's culture, values, and beliefs, and free nature or weakness of human beings. So the flow of le the legend will always be associated with the particular culture where it belongs to. Next, readers of the legend will believe that the main character is capable of overcoming any obstacles in his path and root for him to succeed. So it's always expected, especially from the protagonist of the story. Okay, now let's have the generations. Legends are usually passed down through generations. Prior to printing, legends were passed orally to teach the younger generation a certain set of values. Especially in pre-colonial times when printing hasn't yet existed and all the legends were only orally passed. So for the structure of legends, it is usually episodic as the phases of a journey over several years or the stages of a great battle. Some legends tell the entire life story of their hero as a series of linked episodes. So for legend structure, we have chronological episode, journey stories, sequential stories, life stories, and communities, histories. And for style, we have rich, evocative vocabulary, memorable language use, formal -like openings and endings, imagery, simile, metaphor, and symbolism. Okay, now let's talk about myths. So as its purpose, the usual purpose of the myths is to provide an explanation for the origins of phenomena like thunder, day and night, winter, by telling the story of how they came to be. So a while ago, it was mentioned that uh, Filipinos used to make stories, not to make the environment less fearsome, right? So here, instead of being afraid of, uh, for instance, thunder, no, stories were created to serve as their mythical explanations. So most cultures use myths handed down already from generation to generation from an anonymous source to explain the world and its mysteries. So mythology from different regions usually reflects the wonders that people see around them in their own environment. So um, in Western culture, particularly in the beliefs of ancient Greeks, they have a different explanation about the natural seasons of the environment and it has something to do with the with goddess Demeter and her abducted daughter Persephone and that myth or that myth explains why there are four seasons no if you're familiar with that myth so yeah even other cultures have their own mythical explanations and myths often provide directed clues that help to build a picture of the beliefs, lifestyles, and ideology of the people who first told them. So it allows us to look at the perspectives or lives of those people from ancient times. Okay, so for the themes of myths, uh, myths are set in the past, usually a distant and not specific past, and are presented as something that actually happened. There is evidence that the content of some myths, only some myths, is based on real events and places that may have existed. But again, those evidences are not strong enough for us to believe in. And myths explain why the world is the way it is, and for this reason, they reflect the basic principles of the religion or spirituality of people. But it still depends upon the culture where uh, those myths are derived from. In relation to Norse and Greek myths, these stories narrate what the gods did and how they interacted with humans. Yep, we know that uh, the intervention of gods always happens in Greek mythology, and they either help or make the situations worse and chaotic. Okay, so here we have some examples of themes. 
Opposites occur frequently in myths as themes including good and evil, night and day, calm and storm, wise and foolish, old and young, beautiful and ugly, mean and generous, just and unjust. So there's always a contradiction when it comes to the themes. And like other traditional stories, myths use quests, journeys, and trials as themes. The hero or heroine often has to undergo some kind of test or set off on a long and difficult journey where dangers arise at each stage. So, uh, in relation to Greek mythology, a uh, quest has something to do with uh, the story of Jason and his quest for the Golden Fleece. And journeys, for journeys, we have the story of Odysseus and the Odyssey. And also the Arcanos, because they also had been to a journey with uh, with Jason. And for trials, uh, the story of Hercules and his 12 labors. Okay, for plot and structure, the plot of a myth usually includes incredible or miraculous supernatural and superstitious events where characters behave in superhuman ways using unusual powers or with the help of superhuman being so that's true characters tend to be more powerful when they are being helped or assisted by gods now let's have the characters Characters typically of traditional stories appear in myths, talking animals, rich kings, foolish young men, clever villains, although the trickster character is often a mischievous god. So gods in myths do not always possess perfect and righteous characteristics. They are even sometimes a reason why things get chaotic, because they like to always intervene in the lives of humans. And they are also not as all-knowing and perfect as a real god. Remember that design myth about the sun, moon, and the stars? Diba, Captain was known as the supreme deity of the Visayans, but he was blinded by his anger when his evil grandson planned the secret assault on heaven. So, he struck even his good grandsons with thunderbolt, and in the end, he was so regretful because um, he realized that he could no longer revive them. So with that, we can say that there are also times that gods and myths got off guard of their actions too. And uh, they're also being affected by their rage. They also make mistakes like humans. No? Next, the most notable character types in this subclass are classic heroes and supernatural beings. And characterization is an interesting focus for Composition when children write their own myths or retell versions because the characters need to be aspiring and larger than life. So, characterization, uh, it's the description of a character's physical traits or how a character look, looks like. But like you said, even the point of view, personality, and the thoughts and actions of the characters are involved here. So, this can be applied when children already write their own myths. And as the last feature of myth, we have the style. So rich, evocative, vocabulary, and use of imagery are typical, but style is often more literary than other types of tales, so that's some versions offering more challenging learning for children. Yep, learning is really more fun when the learner is challenged by it. And myths often include very vivid description of characters and settings. Dense, mysterious rainforests or icy, mist shrouded mountain peaks, and fast moving narration of action. Then they tend to make less use of dialogue and repetition than some other types of traditional story. Simile is used widely to help convey grand settings and describe awe inspiring characters. So that's all from our report. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you learned a lot.